everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Army worms continue to be a challenge for producers growing their summer crops. And recently, those same insects caused significant damage in areas beyond the boundaries of the farm. SUNUP's Curtis Hare talks with our extension entomologist, Dr. Tom Royer, to learn more. Normally when we're talking to Tom Roy, we're standing in a sorghum field or a soybean field, but uh, Tom, some folks might have woken up pretty recently with their yards, you know, uh, pretty chewed down by army worms. Some of them even, when they called me, they said, three days ago I had a green lawn, today I got a dead lawn. I mean, it, it was that quick. So yes, I've, uh, we've been getting a lot of calls on that, and it's due to fall army worm. The thing with fall army worms that's interesting is that there's two strains. We have one that we call the corn strain. That's the one that comes out of South Texas that overwinters there and then can, kind of comes up the central plains most of the most years. There's another strain called the rice strain that likes grasses more even more than corn and sorghum and it comes uh, it overwinters in Florida but we've had some different kind of weather this year and apparently it brought them into Oklahoma uh, and it surprised everybody. When we're talking about damage, is that something that uh, you know people are going to have to consider? You know, going back into the spring if their yard is really torn down. Well, um, there's there's I think two situations. It's been my experience that it's really hard to kill Bermuda grass. It'll take it. It'll they'll they'll come out and maybe make the yard look bad now, but Bermuda grass is very resilient. It'll come back. Um, if you seeded something like if you seeded fescue, uh, grass or something like that, might be a little little different story and you may have to re, kind of redo it because if they get down and, uh, and, and chew on the newly seeded fescue, it probably won't come back and you'll have to reseed. So management, I mean, you have, you have a little setup right here. So what, what are we looking at? What can people do to try to control this? This, this is for people that want to know whether they should treat or not. And hopefully they're doing this before they have a dead lawn. It's just basically get a little soap, uh, putting a couple teaspoons of soap or tablespoons of soap in a uh, gallon of water. And what happens is, is that the army worms don't like this when, when it's uh, sprayed on the or when it, when you put it on the ground and they're hiding under the the. the, the thatch they don't like the soap and it irritates them and they come to the surface once they once it get they get exposed to it so what we do is just typically suggest uh, that we go into an area like this and um, just back and forth over you know maybe like a square yard or or so and if it gets down and touches them they'll come right up out of the ground um, I've seen it happen a lot of times, and it's a way for a homeowner to decide whether they need to treat or not. The army worm has a life cycle of about 30 days, so whatever is out here now is going to be pupating. They'll be in the soil for a while. They'll come out as adult moths, and they'll uh, mate and start laying eggs. So every 30 days, uh, we could have another cycle, but producers need to be aware of them because they can come out every 30 days until we get a killing frost. Uh, they'll be here. Finally, before we let you go, you know, shifting off to, you know, our crops, mm -hmm. sorghum, uh, maybe even soybean, and then of course, as you know, wheat starts to come up when, yeah. uh, after, after planting. So what are you seeing right now in regards to our crops? Well, I know sorghum growers, any, especially if you're growing double crop sorghum, soybean, you gotta be careful of it because if these caterpillars don't have anything else to heat, they'll, they'll move on to that. Uh, and then of course, wheat growers in the fall when we start seeding, they need to be on top of it too, because you you want to get that crop going, if you're, especially if you're going to graze cattle in the fall. Normally, I don't uh, recommend treating uh, fall armyworm and world stage sorghum before the head comes out, because they're also a headworm. But this year, I would probably change my recommendations and say, yeah, you need to be treating, because there's enough of the fall armyworms out there uh, in large enough numbers that maybe need to protect your sorghum crop. All right, thanks Tom. Tom Royer, Extension Entomologist here at Oklahoma State University. And Tom has a lot of fact sheets on army worms and for a link to that, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, 
Wes Lee here with the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. Summer has been relentless at giving up its hold on Oklahoma. This past week was likely the hottest of the year. On Tuesday, the statewide average high temperature was 97.3. We should be starting to cool down by this time of year with mesonet long-term averages being around 91 degrees. The five-day rainfall map from Wednesday mainly consisted of one good band of rain in the northern half of the state. Rain peaked in Muskogee County with Haskell reporting almost three and a half inches. You can see this beneficial rainfall on our four-inch soil moisture map. We see good moisture levels shown in green in most of the southern two-thirds of the state. The one exception would be the orange color blob in the center of the state from McLean to Seminole counties. In the northwest and Panhandle, the shallow soil moisture continues to be seriously low as shown by the red colors on the map. The forecast for next week is a little up in arms depending upon the track of several tropical storms in the Gulf. It could be a really wet week or virtually no rain at all, but the heat is likely to continue to be above normal. Gary is up next with the latest drought map for Oklahoma. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well another week with some pretty good rains over parts of the state that have helped the drought picture but not everybody got the rains they needed. Let's take a look at the latest drought map and see where we're at. So we've basically eliminated all the drought in the state. That that was down there in south central, southeastern Oklahoma is now gone. We just now have a little tiny patch of abnormally dry conditions. However, we now have a larger area of moderate drought centered up in northwestern Oklahoma on Woods County over into uh, Alfalfa County and also to the west in Harper County and of course down to the south as well. So that's the area we're currently looking at for drought intensification if we don't get some good rains in that area. Now, I know it's been dry over the last 30 days but the 60 day rainfall still shows the problem areas a little bit better than that 30 day uh, a time frame. So we see up there in northwestern parts of the state Buffalo has only had 2.1 inches of rainfall so we see those greens and the, uh, the the darker greens. Those are the regions where the rainfall is just not quite as much. The percent of normal rainfall map from the Mesonet for the last 60 days really shows it pretty well. Again, up there in Buffalo and Harper County, 42% of normal rainfall over the last 60 days. Now, besides the heat, the big uh, storyline in the weather for the coming week will be a possible tropical system impacting the Gulf Coast. Now, it does look like it's going to swing up to the northeast away from Oklahoma, but you can never tell. So it's always something to keep an eye out for because there's a lot of rain associated with these types of systems. As we can see in this seven-day rainfall map, which shows upwards of 10 to 15 inches of rainfall down along the Gulf Coast. Now, of course, we don't want that kind of rainfall up over Oklahoma. Uh, we don't need it that badly, but some parts of the state do need some rainfall, especially across northwest Oklahoma. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Dr. Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist, joins us now. Daryl, I understand box beef prices have risen sharply recently. Give us an idea of what's behind this. You know, we've seen another uh, strong rally in the last month. If we back up and look at going into the summer, we had an unexpectedly strong uh, April or uh, May and June, early June on box beef. And that's kind of expected going into grilling season, although it was stronger than expected then. It dropped back off from that as it often does in the, in the heat of summer. Uh, and then it's coming back up. Uh, and we think of that as being the, the last buying for Labor Day weekend, if you will, happening in August. But it's stronger than that. We're seeing a very strong rally that's going even higher than it did in uh, in May and June. Now, is it specific beef products that are kind of driving this increase in, in cutout values? You know, if you look across, uh, you know, start with the primals, uh, they're all up to some extent. Uh, so end meats as well as middle meats. However, the main driver in this, the biggest increase is in the rib. So the rib primals up about 45% in the last month. And within that, the rib roll specifically is up about 60%. So that's a big part of this uh, this rally. Where do you think this demand is kind of coming from? Well, it's, I think, a combination of things. Again, it's still summertime. We think of grilling demand and so on, and that's clearly part of it. I think food service demand, restaurant demand is maybe a little stronger than usual this time of year. Folks are still getting out. Restaurants are opening up. There's probably still some inventory building. And finally, I think part of it is export-driven. Um, 
the ribs are exported as well as some of the uh, like chuck products and those are up w as well so we won't have the data to confirm that for a while but I think exports are probably playing a, a significant role in this. And then with this in mind how does that translate to cattle markets is it positive news we're seeing? Absolutely you know we've been seeing improvement in cattle markets we're sort of poised to really uh, enjoy some stronger prices here in the last part of the year uh, and that's predicated on the demand that we're seeing and this demand is, is exceptionally strong uh, so as we go forward, the cattle number situation is, is tightening up, improving a little bit, and we're going to be positioned to really take advantage of this strong demand and, and see some, some really positive cattle prices in the last part of the year. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Daryl Peel, thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner on Sun Up. Uh, to this point this summer, we've been blessed with good rains. We've had some mild temperatures, but it is August in Oklahoma. And so our topic this week is heat stress. We are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Barry Whitworth, who's going to discuss this topic with us. Without further ado, here's Barry. Now we've had some really nice weather uh, this summer in Oklahoma. I think the average temperature according to the mesonet was uh, less than 80 degrees in July. As we go into August and maybe September though, we may see some warm temperatures. Uh, cattle are pretty comfortable unless the temperature gets up above 85 degrees and, in, and high humidity also contributes to their discomfort. Heat stress will set, set in. Uh, you know, I think most people are well aware of when the cattle are hot, they're gonna go find some shade or they're gonna go uh, get in that pond and get belly deep in the water to try to stay cool. Uh, this is a good time for cattle producers to observe their animals uh, to make sure uh, that they don't see any of those that are suffering from excessive heat stress. Uh, clinical signs that we would look for, since we know that most of the uh, English origin cattle don't sweat nearly as well as the Boston Indicus breeds, uh, they've got to keep themselves cool by increasing their respiration. So if you see cows that are open mouth breathing, breathing or maybe have a tongue protruding while they're breathing or they have excess salivation, you know, they really have copious amounts of saliva in their mouth or in their nasal passages, these are clues that these cows are too hot. Uh, they need some relief. Relief uh, for cattle that are heat stressed, usually uh, we get some water on them and try to increase air circulation. I mean, if you have the ability to get a fan blowing on them while you're putting that water on, that will help quite a bit. I think the main thing that we have to remember is we try to manage heat stress. The most important thing is that these animals have plenty of cool, clean water. They need to have adequate space. When you have several animals that are hot, they're gonna drink maybe two gallons per 100 pounds per day. Uh, they're gonna fight for that water source, so you may have to increase uh, the amount of space that they have for water. Other things that we can do to manage heat stress uh, are make sure you've got a place for those cows to get out of the sun, make sure uh, that we control the flies. Flies cause those animals to bunch up. We want them to stay spread out, which will increase that airflow. If you're feeding cattle, obviously we can't do anything about cattle grazing pastures, but if you're feeding cattle, remember the rumen is a big fermentation vat. It creates heat. So we ought to feed our cattle later in the day, maybe in the evening, so that when that fermentation process takes place, it'll be at a cooler time. Also remember, if you've got to work cattle, get started on it early, be done by 10 a.m. Don't work the cattle after 10 a.m. Just keep in mind that August and September can be very hot months and keep a close eye on your cattle for any signs of heat stress. With wheat planting just a few weeks away, now's the time to start thinking about pre-plant herbicide. To learn more, here's SunUp's Ed Barron with our Extension Weed Scientist, Dr. Misha Manucheri. So no matter what kind of wheat system we're going into, whether we're grazing and harvesting or maybe doing both, the best thing we want to do is start clean. Uh, we know that our crop is going to be 
the most competitive um, if it's not competing for resources with other weed species. So starting clean is great. Uh, if you are open to tillage, some kind of mechanical operation um, is a great strategy. So we're not always relying just on herbicides, but um, herbicides work as well as a burn down treatment. So now's the time that people should be thinking about their applications. Uh, important dates are coming up. What advice do you have for producers uh, going forward? So if you are burning down with uh, a non-selective herbicide like glyphosate and you're tank mixing with any synthetic auxins like 2,4-D and dicamba, be cautious about some of those plant back intervals. We do have some timing windows that we need to meet before we plant wheat. Um, and also be thinking about is this a crop you're going to possibly take off um, in the summer or are you going to graze it out? If it's something we're going to harvest, our weed management might be a little bit more intensive. As we're moving into fall, the weather's going to be changing. It's been pretty wet this past summer, but as things change, how is that going to affect the way that producers go about applications this year? So many of our summer annual species are finishing their life cycle. The weeds that are going to be the most problematic in winter wheat are going to be our winter annuals. Uh, many of our grasses, broadleafs, those plants are going to wait until we cool down for them to germinate. So if we're planting and it's still kind of warm, it just really depends on the fall. Um, we have temperatures that are still in the low 70s, which can happen. A lot of our winters aren't going to be quite up out of the ground yet. So we need to be paying attention to when they do germinate and just making sure that we make timely applications. The price of feed has been going up quite dramatically over the past year. And some people may be thinking of moving to dual purpose. Uh, what advice do you have for producers that are, maybe it's their first time considering dual purpose. What do you have for them? So, for those from a weed management perspective, if maybe um, you're a producer who hasn't taken your grain off um, in the summer and you've mostly grazed out or terminated, there is an application timing that we call delayed pre, which is shortly after the wheat comes up. Um, and we have some pre-emergence herbicides, delayed pre that we can use at that timing. That is a good time to control grasses. So you can be thinking about harvesting um, clean grain in the summer. And then uh, you've got some fact sheets available for people who are making these kinds of decisions right now. Yeah, we'll link some. Um, I think a few that would be important at this time. We have one on tank mix considerations and then also another one on those delayed pre-emergence products. All right, thank you, Misha. Dr. Misha Manucheri, Extension Weed Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Talking summer crops now with our cropping system specialist, Josh Lofton. And Josh, you know, standing right here in sorghum, and sorghum is probably, is coming along a lot faster than you originally expected. Yeah, yeah, uh, a lot of our, our more early planted summer crops, uh, particularly the corn, but maybe even some folks that got, got their sorghum in, uh, maybe uh, early, middle, even, even stretching into the later part of May. And the biggest thing growers need to look at is maturity on their crop. Um, and the, the good thing for, for corn and sorghum, black layer is what you're looking for. Uh, we have a corn here, basically just uh, took a cob, uh, you know, kind of broke it in half, kind of looking at the kernels right in the middle, and, and that's kind of what, what we're looking for black layer, um, kind of right on the edge of that kernel. And, and the same thing really for sorghum, kind of uh, ahead as it develops, we like to kind of get right there in the center, just take a seed, Right where that seed attached to the panicle, we should have a little black dot. Uh, that means it's mature. Once we've hit that black layer, we, we uh, actually can actively go out there, uh, put out a desiccant such as our sodium chlorates, our, our glyphosates uh, to, to potentially either even out the field or dry it down uh, uh, to get it ready for harvest. What are you seeing right now actually in the fields with armyworms and are there any other pests that are you know, causing issues as producers are about to harvest? Yeah, as, as we've kind of come on, we've we've heard some accounts here and there on sugarcane aphids with grain sorghum. That that is a, a constant pest, and it can be just as bad of a pest at harvest as it can be in season. But we do have really big pockets of pests that are being very detrimental. And in this field, it's kind of why we're here today. Um, we had a big infestation of chinch bugs. Um, and you can actually kind of see them going into this plant. Um, this is a really heavy pressure. 
We don't often think about chinch bugs being significantly yield limiting, but when they get this high a pressure, this stage in the sorghum, we can cause a, a major issue. And you can actually see this yellowing, um, th that's their impact onto this plant. And some of the varieties that, that were taking a little bit more of an impact are, are actually having lodging issues. So some of these rainstorms we've had when the wind comes through, they're already laying on the ground they're not gonna make anything. This right here, will it finish, will it not? It, it'll probably have a trouble finishing filling out this seed head and this grain, but we have another, another variety here. This is actually a variety trial that still has chinch bug pressure in, but, but is doing a lot better. We see that it's a lot greener comparatively. It's, it's not got that yellow kind of look to it. It's not really uh, stressing as bad as this other plant is. So we have some variety difference on how they've responded to chinch bugs. Not only from uh, certain varieties are getting uh, infested and some of them aren't, but some of them are taking that infestation a lot better. Very similar to what we see in things like sugarcane aphid and, and, and other, uh, some of those other uh, pests that we have. Yeah, and you know, you know, next week you actually have a, uh, a field day coming up in Texas County. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we're, we're having our, our field day at McCall, uh, the McCall field day. Um, you know, looking at a lot of our summer crops out in the panhandle. Uh, you know, interested in things, you know, irrigated corn and grain sorghum out in the panhandle, variable rate irrigation, variable rate nitrogen. We have a great looking variety test out there. It's going to be um, next Thursday. Uh, and so call the Texas County Extension Office or, or the research station out there, get an RSVP to them. Um, and uh, it, it'll be great having people out in the field coming to look at the crops. Alrighty, thanks Josh. Thank you. Josh Lofton, Cropping System Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like a link to the field day he was talking about, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Grain markets have been pretty volatile lately. Now starting with wheat, what has been going on in the markets? Well, you go back last week, uh, we had a 40 cent decline in wheat prices and Medford prices dropped from $7.17 down to $6.77. But this week, they've been wandering around in about a, a 10 cent range, somewhere around that 680. The basis has been steady. If you look at forward contracting for 2022 wheat, you can forward contract in Medford now for $6.80. What about corn and sorghum prices? Well, they've also been volatile. And you go back last week, corn prices fell from $5.58 to $5.21. That's a 37 cent decline. But again, this week, watered around in about a 20 cent range down around $5.20. Sorghum follows corn prices at Medford from $6.13 down to $5.50. This week, uh, the price is $5.50 to $5.55. Just not much happening there. And what about soybeans and cotton? Well, they're a little different than the corn and the wheat. Uh, soybeans, they knocked off 80 cents off the market on the last couple of weeks, uh, from $13 to $12.20, but put on a, another 40 cents this week, so they recovered a little bit. They're back to about $12.60. Cotton got up to 95 cents last week. It went down to 93. It's Waller, 93, 94 now. And canola, if you're looking at forward contracting canola for harvest delivery of next year, 22, $11.40. That's a pretty good canola price. What's causing the increase there? Well, low production this year. With the drought in the northern United States and Canada, we're losing that crop. The uh, European canola crop, which is the major area for producing canola, they're having problems with the crop. And so it's just lack of supply with canola. And it's next year before we'll get any more canola. And so price is going to remain relatively high. Now, overall, prices seem to have stabilized a bit. Uh, what are the, what's the reasoning there? No new information. We were getting a lot of information in the last couple of weeks. Russia going from 3.1 billion bushels down to less than 2.7. European Union rain going on there in France, Germany. German crop down around 4%. Europe, the uh, France crop uh, about 40%, less than 40% of its milling quality. Uh, you've got South America, you've got uh, early uh, freeze down there, you've got dry conditions. All that information was last week. This week, not much has changed. So from here, where are prices expected to go, up or down? 
Yes, they will. <laughs> I, I, every day, at the end of the market every day, we're at equilibrium and there's a 50% chance of prices going up and a 50% chance of prices going down. And I think the market is comfortable with where it is right now. Uh, there's going to be some things happening relatively soon in the corn market because once that corn starts hitting the scales, uh, the, uh, the crop tours had corn production above USDA, so we'll see how that works out. So things can happen pretty fast in corn and in beans. Uh, with wheat, I think it's a little more stable. So it's really just a waiting game at this it's point. It's a flip of the coin. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kim. Dr. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. As most of our agricultural producers know, we regularly use ivermectin to treat internal and external parasites for, for things like intestinal, intestinal worms, uh, lice, uh, heartworms in our, in our cats and dogs, for instance. However, the products, preparations, and dosages of these ivermectin products vary widely between animal species and the specific condition that we're trying to treat. These ivermectin products, preparations, and dosages vary widely between animal species and vary even more widely between ivermectin that would be appropriate for human use and only under the prescription of a physician. I encourage uh, people to have a discussion with their medical professional about these topics related to, uh, related to the pandemic and, and seek out the best advice from their physician on what's appropriate to them based on their risk. Thanks so much for joining us for SUNUP this week. A reminder, you can see us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at SUNUP.